Hello, my name is Will Meshnig, and I'm a discussion group student coordinator and a member of the Student Advisory Board here at the Dole Institute. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program. Discussion groups are made possible by Newman's Own Foundation, and we'd like to thank the Dolph Simons Family Fund for sponsoring Jerry's residency. Today's program will be live streamed and available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos and of past Dole Institute programs by visiting our YouTube channel at any time. After the program, we'll have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker will approach you with a microphone. For virtual view viewers, please send your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu, dolequestions at ku.edu. Please ask just one brief question. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind, and again, just ask one brief question. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to turn off your cell phone, please. And now, please join me in welcoming our director, Audrey Coleman. Thank you, Will. Uh, so great to see so many of you here with us this afternoon. I see a lot of repeat, repeat uh, attendees, and so I'm so pleased that you've stayed with us uh, for this third installment of, our, of Jerry Sibes' discussion group series, and this afternoon, uh, focusing on the Kansas picture. Uh, before I turn it over to Jerry, I just wanted to recognize a few special people uh, who are with us in the audience today. Uh, we just wrapped up our annual Board of Advisors meeting here for the Dole Institute, and I wanna be sure and name and recognize and thank those people who have given so much of their time and talent and, and uh, investment over the years uh, in, in the Dole Institute. Uh, we have, and if, so I'm gonna call your name if you wouldn't mind standing up, folks. That'd be great. Peter Fenn. Joe Gaylord, Fred Logan, Betty Morris, Mike Pettit, Doug Smith, Karen Stewart, and Jim Slattery is a member of our advisory board as well. Please join me in giving them a round of applause and saying thank you. <laughs> it's an honor to work with each one of you. Thank you so much for being here. All right. Uh, I'm proud to turn it over to Jerry. Jerry, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you all for being here. I see an um, exceptionally large number of familiar faces today, so that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Um, it's kind of an all in the family conversation. Um, and I'm grateful to you all for being here. You know, I have um, been telling people all year that this year in politics, Kansas has it all. And I think that's not an overstatement, it's amazing. Uh, the abortion referendum in the summer was the most important political event of the year so far, I think, in many ways. You've got one of the most important and most closely watched governor's races um, in, in the country. You've got an interesting congressional race after a redistricting battle. Um, and there's yet another constitutional amendment uh, on, the, on the ballot uh, legislative veto amendment. So it's all kind of wrapped up here. And I am thrilled to have uh, two friends and really great, smart, bipartisan voices here to talk about that. Uh, it's a bit of a cliche for somebody who's a moderator to say somebody doesn't need an introduction. Might actually be true today, but I'm going to go ahead and do introductions anyway. Jeff Collier, um, as you all know, served, um, has served the state of Kansas in many ways. He was a member of the Kansas House, then the Kansas Senate. He served as lieutenant governor for seven years, and then as the state's 47th governor. Uh, beyond that, he's a practicing surgeon. He's volunteered his medical services in danger spots around the globe, a long list of danger spots. Um, he's a medical school graduate of KU and also has degrees from Georgetown University and Cambridge University. And far more important than all that, he is like me, a native of Hayes and a graduate of Thomas More Prep High School. So thank you very much for being here. <laughs> uh, Jim Slattery is a native of Atchison, the other half of the state on the east, who served uh, Kansas in the U.S. House of Representatives for 12 years, um, and then he served prior to that in the Kansas House for six years, mm -hmm. so he's got uh, Topeka and Washington experience. Since leaving Congress, he's been doing very interesting work, practicing law, um, doing fascinating international work, uh, travels regularly as he just has in the last two weeks to the Middle East, uh, including to Iran, not this time. Um, uh, he's um, been an, a, a regular visitor to Ukraine where he's had clients among the Ukrainian leadership over the years um, and has been an interna international election monitor in Iraq, Ukraine, and Nicaragua. 
Um, and uh, above, all, uh, I th of all, above all those things, he's not only the, on the advisory board here, but I think it's fair to say that in uh, Senator Bob Bell's final years, Jim probably ranked as his favorite Democrat. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah. Jeff, as I, let me start with both of you with a kind of a 10,000 foot question. As I said, there's a little bit of everything uh, this year, and it's been a roller coaster ride politically in Kansas already this year. Um, how do you think the political landscape looks now versus the way perhaps it looked at the beginning of the year? What's changed already? Um, well, the first thing that's changed is everybody started paying attention about a week ago. Yeah. Okay, and so um, now things are really starting to boil um, in, in Kansas politics, um, which is kind of unusual. Usually there's a, a larger run up from, from both sides and it has not been that. That being said though, um, we've also seen something that's kind of unprecedented from my Democratic side, which is, you know, for example, Laura Kelly, has been on every Royals game on television the entire season. <laughs> We've never had that in Kansas politics uh, before. Um, you know, but our, our Democratic colleagues over the last couple of election cycles um, have out fundraised the Republican side three to one, five to one in, in many of these instances. Um, and so uh, the world has kind of changed a, a little bit. Um, right now, people are really starting to focus. Um, you have some competing themes that are going on, and I think a lot can happen uh, over the next month uh, or so as people focus on, and you know, if trouble happens somewhere, um, I think that can have an, you know, a real impact on an election that is probably you know, within four points of each other yeah. right now. Jim, I think at the beginning of the year, uh, you might have said, I probably did say, that um, Governor Kelly was probably in some danger, um, that uh, this was going to be a good year for Republicans because the president was down and the economy was uh, cr uh, causing anxiety, um, and that the abortion referendum might easily energize Republicans more than Democrats. Um, that's not the picture today. So for your party, I assume, uh, the picture's a lot brighter now than it would have been yeah. at the beginning. Well, long story real short, uh, in January, I think it's safe to say that Governor Kelly's chances of re-election were probably not very good from a historic standpoint. Being a, a presidential off-election year historically is not good for the party in power, although in Kansas there are specific examples where that has not been the case. But today I would say that, that Governor Kelly is in a very solid position, and uh, I think that the, uh, the uh, uh, value of them both uh, amendment referendum has really energized a lot of young voters in this state, as evidenced by the bump up in registration numbers. Here in Douglas County, someone told me today that, that, uh, that there was a dramatic increase in the 18 to 24 year old uh, registration numbers. And I think that's true across the state. I think that women have been very energized by the uh, uh, Dobbs decision at the Supreme Court overturning Roe versus Wade. And I believe that as a result of that decision, what we're gonna see this fall for the first time in 40 years, we're gonna see there being more single issue pro-choice voters in Kansas and across the country than single-issue pro-life voters. And that's gonna work to the benefit of Governor Kelly, and it's gonna work to the benefit of Congresswoman Davids. And when you look at the numbers in the value of them both referendum, and look at the third district of Kansas where the numbers were about 68%, I believe, voted no on the amendment, and the vote statewide stunned people on both sides. I think the Republicans put the uh, referendum on the primary election ballot, assuming there would be a lot more Republicans and a lot more pro-life voters showing up in that primary. But what they didn't anticipate was Dobbs and then about two months time elapsed. And during that period of time, there was a whole bunch of people decided to vote in that primary. And the number was up 500,000 
<laughs> over uh, the typical turnout in a non-presidential election primary. I think that is an indication of just how intense a lot of people feel about that issue. But, but Jeff, there is a big difference between uh, that election in August and the general election. The matrix is much more complicated. There are other races on the ballot, and there is a national overlay. What's the carryover effect from what Jim just talked about, abortion referendum to general election, and what doesn't carry over? Yeah, um, I think it, it energizes more folks on, on the Democrat side uh, now, and uh, but uh, there's also a certain element of as time passes, that fervor uh, you know drops back. Um, you know, right now, you know, you're starting to see the debate is shifting, or it may or may not shift um, on inflation, and and you know, Republicans are trying to focus on <coughs> pocketbook issues. My Dem colleagues are are really focusing, you know. Their focus is on that as a as a mobilizer, and you know people are sorting it out. And I think the really interesting thing, though, is people are really engaged. Yeah. Um, and you know over the you know over the last you know 12 years or so, we've seen more and more Kansans vote in every single election. It's been going up, you know, year after year after year. Um, in, and particularly, you know, elections were very different than they were in, in the 90s. Um, and we have much more engagement, you know, right now. And I think people are really going to be sorting this out. They, they really are paying attention. Um, yeah, and I, the, the turnout for the referendum vote mm -hmm. in August, the primary, was double. I looked at the numbers, literally double what it was four years earlier. Mm -hmm. So you've got hyper engagement by that standard. Mm -hmm. Um, but let me step back from this. I want to get into the, the, the governor's race a little bit more and some of the other issues that are going to be in the ballot. But I've talked to both of you about the unique nature of Kansas politics. It's a very Republican, very conservative state, but it's also got a very wide independent streak. I mean, in fact, more of the new registrants that you referred to, Jim, this year registered as unaffiliated than as either Democrats or Republicans. Mm -hmm. To, and as you said, it's got a, the state has a history of electing Democratic governors, but never sends Democrats to the Senate. To what do you attribute this quirky, independent nature of Kansas? I wanted both of you to address that, but Jim, I'll let you start. Um, I mean, <laughs> this goes back to our entry into the Union, in, yeah. you know, in 1861. I mean, our state was born in this referendum about whether we were going to enter the Union free or slave. And uh, a lot of people in Kansas and the people that, well, not, I don't want to get off on a history lesson, but, but the long story short is we have been sort of a contrarian state for a long time. And, uh, and I think we still are. And we do have this deep sense of independence and I think we have a history of rejecting extremism on the right and the left. And this state is very comfortable right in the middle of the road. And I think that Governor Kelly has done a pretty darn good job of capturing the middle in, a, in state politics today. So, uh, you know, you, know you, you just go back historically, and I was just thinking that 1966, um, Bob Docking defeated a Republican incumbent, Bill Avery, Lyndon Johnson's midterm, which was a disaster for Democrats nationally. And in 1978, uh, John Carlin defeated an incumbent Republican governor, Bob Bennett, in Jimmy Carter's off election year. Mm -hmm. You know, so we were doing things that just didn't quite add up and, and didn't fit the national trends. And, you know, one of the things I would observe also is that um, we have in this state. Uh, a record, a history of electing women to high public office going back, you know, to the 1880s even. But most recently, I mean, in fact, I could not find an example in my lifetime of a woman running for re-election in Kansas statewide that lost. Hmm. <laughs> And, uh, in, I think in both parties. In, in either, either party. party. Okay, so, I mean, you can go back to Elwell Shanahan, Nancy Kassebaum, uh, Joan Finney. Uh, wow. 
you know, the a long list of women who, once they established their credibility and demonstrated their competence to the people of Kansas, Kansans embraced them. And one of the things very interesting about this lecture right now is the gender gap. <laughs> and it's very fascinating to me because we have 51%, 53% of the voters that are, that are female committed to voting for, for Governor Kelly right now, and about 35% of women that are committed to voting for, for uh, uh, Schmidt. And it's flipped with men just exactly almost the opposite. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. I'm going to bet on the women. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So, Jeff, when we talked about this a few weeks ago, you said an interesting thing. You said there's just an ebb and flow to politics in Kansas. And I guess as Jim, Jim's brief history lesson uh, indicates, that's been true for a long time. There's an ebb and flow. How would you describe yeah. the ebb and flow today? Yeah, and, and there really is an ebb and flow, you know, going back and forth, uh, you know, over the years. And there are other things that all, you know, we, we tend not to, you know, elect Republicans after a Republican for governor. And, uh, you know, and the Senate is a, a different critter uh, altogether. But also in that ebb and flow, you know, there are other confounding factors uh, that happen. Uh, you know, some of those confounding factors uh, are resources, um, you know, and so, you know, when you have, you know, incumbency, um, you know, you generally have tremendous resources compared. We've also had bad candidates, bad incumbents on both sides that didn't, you know, weren't able to raise resources or didn't conduct a very good campaign. Um, and I think that plays into it as well. Um, there's one other thing to talk about, and that is the demography of, of politics in the United States and in Kansas has changed dramatically from 1980. So if you sit there and think about, um, if you would just split us down in age at 50, so if you're below 50 or above 50, for in, in 1980, that split was about 68-32 um, in it. Well, that shift over the last few years, and even, even up to the 90s, it was still you know, a 60-40. Well, now we're at a 53-47. And if you think about some of the things that are going on in the country, I think this explains a lot of what's happening in the Kansas politics and nationally that you have two very different outlooks that are very evenly matched. And I think that actually you know, has a pretty big impact yeah. uh, on us. Jim, as you suggested, the citizens, the voters of this state are, uh, do trust Democrats with state office and occasionally in the House, but they don't trust the National Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Why not? <laughs> I wish I had that figured out, you know. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, I think uh, the, the Democratic Party nationally today has uh, um, become perceived as, as too far left, and, and I think Kansans are uncomfortable with that. But, um, you know, we have this strong history here of being a Republican state. And, you know, Jimmy Carter, I think, has run the most, you know, effective campaign for, from the presidential level in 1976 here. And I think he got about, about 46 or 7 percent of the vote in Kansas the year that Bob Dole was on the ticket with Gerald Ford. You know, but since then, Kansas hasn't been competitive at the, at the national level. At the state level, however, for many years, we sort of had an independent brand. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, going back to the Dockings and, and you know, uh, Bob Docking got elected statewide four terms as governor, and he was committed to fiscal responsibility, austere but adequate. Do you remember that old phrase, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. to describe his budgets? Kind of Joe Manchin-like. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And, and John Carlin, you know, was elected twice. And, of course, Kathleen Sebelius and, uh, and, and all of these governors, I think, at the state level, demonstrated that they were good managers of the state budget, and they balanced our budgets, and they managed the state efficiently, 
They supported strongly public education. They supported quality health care and did what they could to expand health care. And uh, I think they really stayed focused on what I call sort of bread and butter issues. Yeah. What has hurt Democrats in Kansas, I believe, through the years is the abortion issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's been a, it's been a real a, a difficult issue for Democrats to deal with at the, at the state level. And, uh, but to answer your question, I think nationally, the Democratic Party has the perception of being too part to the left. Kansas, we have managed, I think, to sort of brand the party differently in Kansas and brand it more moderately and more Kansas-oriented. But, Jeff, to, to pick up on what Jim just said, it's interesting that it, it looks now as if maybe the abortion issue works to the benefit of Democrats this year. How did that happen? Well, I, I think that's the politics of the moment yeah. um, uh, sort of issue. And, it, you know, it was a perfect storm. And it was also, um, you know, when that vote came up, that was the first opportunity for people to express their concerns, uh, you know, about it. And, you know, this was something that had been placed on the ballot two years before. And, you know, and from the Republican side, I mean, if you're gonna have a major constitutional amendment, you wanna have the governor on your side um, on that. The governor's gonna have a big impact on, you know, just how the discussion, how you lead things. Um, Republicans didn't have that, and um, you know they didn't foresee, you know, some of those other aspects on it too. So, if, if um, I could, could I just yeah, piggyback sure. on there a little bit? Um, you know, since 1973 with Roe versus Wade, all the elections since, including 1974, the the Bob Dole Bill Roy race mm -hmm. in Kansas, where abortion that year probably decided the outcome of that election. But uh, I can tell you why. But but uh, uh, since then, um, I think pro-choice voters, predominantly women, knew that Roe versus Wade protected their right to choose. With Dobbs, that constitutional uh, protection was removed. And with the removal of that, now women and other pro-choice voters understand that the state legislators can now address and limit that right. And this issue has now for the first time become very real in the political arena. And in the past, uh, pro-choice voters could vote for a pro-life person knowing that Roe would protect them and their pro-life position was almost irrelevant because they were protected. That is no longer the case. And that's why this issue, this year, nationwide, is going to become a big issue. And it's gonna become a big issue not only for young women, you know, it's gonna become a big issue for older women who remember what it was like before Roe versus Wade. So I think this issue is gonna be very big this year. Yeah. Um, well, with that in mind, <laughs> I, I wanna ask both of you to look down the road. and. Um, not to predict, because I got out of the predicting business in 2016. It's a fool's <laughs> game. Yeah. Um, I can't even predict the past, much less the future. But, <coughs> but talk a little bit about how the next five, six weeks are likely to unfold. Jeff, let me start with you. You talked about how locked in voters are, and that's very striking. Um, does the giant turnout in August presage big turnout in November, in your estimation? And how does your party, the Republican Party, turn that to its advantage and not uh, allow Democrats to do the same? Uh, even without the referendum in August, this would have been the highest turnout mm. in, in years. Um, and you know, so th we were already on that course. Um, I, think that, I think there's you know, time, um, and you've gotta really try to change you know, the debate, the Republicans the Republicans are trying to fight on, you know, really trying to fight on economic issues. Uh, Lord Kelly's done, you know, is out there trying to say, no, I'm the, you know, I've created 40,000 jobs. Well, the fact that, you know, and she can get away with the argument of, I've created 40,000 jobs. When I left office, there were 1,420,000 Kansans working. And today, there are 1,398,000 Kansans working. There's actually 20,000 Kansans jobs that aren't working now. But that mythology can, 
be broadcast uh, out there. And you know, whether they can actually land a punch on some of these bread and butter issues, um, that's, that's what's really gonna happen. And Jim, can we assume that all those people who registered to vote, many of them women, to vote in August are going to stick around and sh will they actually show up in November? Uh, <laughs> we have to be very careful about assuming anything in politics. Yeah. But um, the long story real short is I believe there's going to be a strong turnout by those voters in, in August, in, in November. And, um, you know, I, I think that that Governor Kelly has a really solid record, you know, to run on. And the bottom line of this race is that, that when you have a popular incumbent, as Jeff suggested earlier, they have very significant advantages. Fundraising in all of the constituents that they have served uh, are inclined to reward them. And so you look at the data right now, and Governor Kelly has a uh, approval rating of, of somewhere in the mid-50s. Well, most politicians in America today would die for that approval rating, okay, in this very divisive environment we're in. So she's popular. She's liked. And that is important in politics. She is not offensive to people. She, does not, she doesn't come across as arrogant or, or condescending. She comes across as a very nice person that you'd like to have living next door. That's a big plus. And the, the second thing is, is that, that she has done a remarkable job of restoring the state's financial situation. And, you know, everybody understands that, that three and a half, four years ago, our budget in the state of Kansas was in a mess. And that has now been stabilized and restored. She has adequately funded uh, education. This year, there are 400 and some new transportation jobs and, I mean, 400 new uh, transportation projects and infrastructure projects. This Panasonic uh, announcement in, in Johnson County is huge. I mean, we're talking $4 billion of private investment coming into this state. And Kansas, for the first time in my lifetime, is now attracting more private capital investment in this state per capita than just about any other state in the union. This is huge news for Kansas. And the other issue that I think that Governor Kelly really is going to highlight, and I hope she does, is the fact that the legislature in this state has opposed Medicaid expansion. We have left between five and seven billion dollars of federal money in Washington. I don't know about you all, but I pay a lot of federal income taxes, okay? And I'd like to see some of that federal money finding its way back to Kansas to pay for health care for the working low-income people in this state so, that so, desperately need it. So just let me ask you the flip side of that. I think Jim just did a good job of going through Laura Kelly's assets. What are her liabilities? And conversely, what are Derek Schmidt's biggest assets that he can still play to in the closing six weeks or so? Yeah. Well, um, okay, I think for starters, um, the notion that I, I severely disagree that Laura Kelly has fixed things. I gave her a $900 million surplus, the largest surplus in the history of the state of Kansas at that time, was what she walked into. Um, we had a school finance lawsuit. We've had 50 years of school finance lawsuits going back you know, for five Republican, five Democratic governors. Um, and the most recent one, was filed over the budgets of 2008, 2009, 2010, and those were Kathleen Sebelius' budgets. Now, we're blamed for that, or the Republicans are, are supposedly blamed you know, for that, but it was because the schools weren't financed. When that Supreme Court decision came down, I put together the bipartisan majorities, and it was hard, that actually solved the problem. The Supreme Court went <coughs> and approved it, and in Laura's situation, um, they said, we want to have an inflation adjustment starting in 2023, and to her credit, she did that. But we did the heavy lifting of the billions of dollars that went into that education budget. Uh, and we had more Kansans working than ever before, and now we have fewer than we did then. I don't think that story has been explained very well, but I think the real thing is Derek 
has an opportunity to explain, here's where I am going to take our state. Here's how I want to see us grow. Laura Kelly is trying to express that um, you know, with her Panasonic uh, uh, bid. And Derek is approaching that a little different way. And he's speaking to different audiences than she is. Uh, if you go and you look traditionally, uh, Democratic votes are really in about seven cities, Topeka, mm -hmm. Lawrence, uh, the usual. And you know, Derek is speaking to you know, 75 counties west of here. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there, and you know, for example, there's an entirely different message that's going on in the Kansas City media market than there is in Wichita or in western Kansas. So I think actually both, both candidates are being pretty strategic about it. I think Derek um, has a good opportunity spending his efforts you know, in Wichita, Western Kansas, so it plays very differently, and uh, we'll have to see how that turns out. You know, just to follow up on that, one of the things that we've all seen in national politics is the rise of cultural issues, um, mm -hmm. and a cultural issue here that's come up, particularly in the last few weeks, is a question of tan transgender athletes. Um, is this a big issue or a minor issue? We're going to hear a lot more about it. Um, let me ask you first, Jeff. Um, I think it. I think you will hear it. Tran and just to be clear, transgender athletes' ability to compete in high school sports. Correct, and you know, and Governor Kelly, you know, vetoed the legislature's solution to that twice, uh, and then then goes on television and says, "Of course, men shouldn't be competing against women," but we have two vetoes, and when you can go and pound that message out, you know, with ten million dollars, then you know, things are, are very different. Um, I think what it real I think it plays a little bit differently though, rather than it's specifically on the transgender issue or some of those, it is more like the Virginia model of, you know, are parents in charge of their schools and, you know, what are our kids' educations gonna look like? And, you know, and can Derek prosecute, you know, that argument? Uh, overall is how I think that really truly plays into it. What's your sense of it, Jim? Uh, if you've got abortion maybe the cultural issue of, mm -hmm. of, the, of this campaign, but in the end there is a pattern in which campaigns traditionally come back to the economy. Is, are we gonna see that this fall? Yeah, I, I think that um, this election is gonna be determined by the facts that I've already laid out, and I think that it will also be, you know, modestly affected by these cultural issues. But this is going to be an election decided by economic issues, I believe, here in Kansas. And the bottom line is the state's economy is in pretty darn good shape, <laughs> in arguably very good shape. Uh, I mean, the unemployment rate is very low. People in Kansas, if they want a job, they should be able to get a job if you look at the unemployment rate in this state. So I, I think the, that the election is going to be decided on economic issues, and I think that the problem that, that Schmidt has had is that he hasn't been able to make the case as to why Laura Kelly should be fired. And, and uh, I don't think he's going to be able to make that case in all candor. And the, the cultural issues, I mean, when you talk about this transgender stuff, what are we talking about? Five kids in Kansas? Who in the world knows, you know? And are we going to get off in what I call boogeyman politics at the end of this cam campaign? I hope not. You know, I hope that we can stay focused on the issues that really are about the future. Um, there, there's one other issue on the ballot. I mentioned it obliquely and briefly earlier, which is another constitutional amendment, which hasn't gotten a lot of attention. It's a, a, a legislative veto amendment, which would allow the legislature to overturn executive a actions by the executive branch, regulations, executive orders. Um, is it going to pass, and does it matter, and does it affect any other race? I'll let you start, Jeff. Um, I don't know how it's going to. I don't know how it's going to play. Um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't seen any polling on it, and there hasn't been a whole lot of discussion amongst folks. On the on the one hand, um, Kansans are tending to do some balancing mm -hmm. uh, out there, um, and so, you know, it may it may play a role. You know as a check on the executive, uh, you know, from the Republican side or the D side. 
you know, one of the other things that's kind of related to that is, you know, we, we have this legislature, you know, on the very local level, you know, so, I mean, your 12 precincts, you know, is, is the size, you know, of your, of your legislative district or 18 precincts. And it is, it's pretty clear that if Laura Kelly is being successful at her level, she doesn't have coattails down there in the legislature. If anything, I think the Republicans will probably pick up seats mm -hmm. in, in the legislature. Um, you know, and so how that translates into how people view the legislature, how they view the constitutional amendment, how they view the executive, Kansans are really smart, and I think they'll balance them out. Mm -hmm. um, every election, happens in the national context as well as a local and state context. And in this national context, the two most important figures are Joe Biden, because he's president, obviously, and inescapably, Donald Trump. So let me ask you each to talk about those two guys. And in this context, um, is Biden a net plus or a net minus for Democrats in this state? And is Donald Trump a net plus or a net minus for Republicans in this state? Jim, what do you think? Um, I don't know that, that President Biden is a big plus for Democrats in this state. If I had to say right now, you know, his approval rating now is inching up into the mid-40s, and um, you know, that's, that's into neutral territory almost. So I would say that Biden is not going to have that much influence in the outcome here in Kansas, even though I think that, that uh, uh, Schmidt will do everything he can to make this sort of a referendum on Biden. But I don't think it's going to work. And the Trump, the Trump effect on the other side? If you're asking my I'm opinion. I'm asking you first, yeah. Well, yeah. He'll get his I, turn. The stage is being set here in Kansas for a typical sort of Democrat gubernatorial win because the, the Republican Party is divided and is divided along this Trump issue. So right now we have former Governor Hayden, Republican, former Governor Graves, Republican, two very prominent Republicans out of the moderate wing, I would call the Kassabom Dole wing of the Republican Party that are endorsing Governor Kelly. I mean, that's big. And, uh, and that's reflective of this deep divide within the Republican Party. And one of the things that I think people are really starting to focus on is just how much damage this election denial, the big lie, so to speak, is having on our democracy. And, you know, there's still 60% of the Republicans that believe that somehow Joe Biden didn't win the election, fair and square. And, I mean, that is also reflective of this deep divide. And uh, so right now, the last data I have seen indicates that, that Governor Kelly is going to get somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the Republican vote in this state. It looks like to me she's locked in at about 17 right now with about 20 percent undecided. So if she gets just one half <laughs> of those undecided in independents, she's going to win this election. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I think that's sort of where we're headed. So long story short, historically, Democrats win the governor's office in Kansas only when the Republican Party is divided and divided deeply. And today I would submit that they're as divided as they've been in my lifetime. Jeff, yeah, Biden, uh, and Trump. So, um, you know, for starters, you know, both, you know, both the presidents, um, you know, they help define, you know, how we are approaching things. And we're in this tremendous period of change. I mean, the economy literally is different than it was a month ago. And how we're sitting this coming February, March, April, I think is going to be in a very different situation. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be in a much worse shape. Um, and as I'm looking forward to this, I think people are looking, they'll look to Biden, they'll look to Trump, they'll look other places if they don't see an answer uh, coming from them. Um, and if you want to, you know, if you want to add that other microcosm in there, there's actually a third name on the ballot. Yeah. Okay, and I can I can tell you from personal experience, in 179 votes is all I needed to be different uh, in my situation. <laughs> okay, when we had we had three high school students, and each of those high school students got 3,000 votes. Yeah. Okay, um, just by having your name on the ballot. 
so we have another name on the ballot who is Trumpier than Trump, mm -hmm. um, you know, right now, and has you know left the Republican Party, um, and you know is out there trying to you know grab some of those votes, and and some of my smart Democratic colleagues. I've helped them get on the ballot and help them do signature <laughs> collections and stuff. Because he's but, not stealing votes from Laura Kelly. Because he's not sure. stealing votes from Laura <laughs> Kelly. Yeah. Um, you know, and so, you know, that, you know, that 3% or is it 5% is it yeah. 8% has a big impact. Likewise, in the last governor's race, we actually had, we actually had two Democrats really on the ballot. The third, you know, the third one, Greg Orman, who got, you know, 6%. Uh, or so, you gotta remember, he was, the de he was the de facto Democratic nominee for the U.S. Senate, um, and the Democrats actually pulled their own candidate out of the race uh, on it. So we've, we've seen these three-way mm -hmm. things, um, you know, before, and I think that'll have, that's, a, that's yeah. gonna have a big impact. The, the, the Pyle candidacy on, you know, as the conservative candidate is definitely gonna benefit Kelly, and it, whether it's 1% or mm -hmm. 3%, yeah. That could determine the outcome of the election, yeah. too. It, it's a good point. It probably gets too little attention yeah. in the conversation right now. Mm -hmm. I, I have a couple more questions for you guys, and then I'm going to open it up to, to all of you, so load up. Um, um, <laughs> Figuratively. One, for, <laughs> thank you. Um, one race we haven't talked about it, that's the other fascinating one is the Sharice Davids uh, race. Um, I, again, at the beginning of the year, sitting where I was in, on the East Coast, I would have said, she's in deep trouble if not. Dead. It doesn't look that way so much now. Um, the dynamic of that race is its own, and it comes in the wake of this redistricting battle, mm -hmm. which uh, was an attempt to make the, her district much harder for her to win. Uh, let me just ask you each to give a quick synopsis of how that looks and feels to you right now. Jim, why don't you start? I, I think that uh, Sharice Davids is going to be a big beneficiary of Dobbs and uh, and the uh, the referendum vote on the constitutional amendment here in Kansas value them both um, and in her district I mean in the third district even with Franklin County added I think the numbers in a in uh, opposition to the constitutional amendment is somewhere in the high 60s about 67 percent somewhere in that range and uh, you know I think it's going to be a big issue in Johnson County and in in Franklin County and in the entire third district and her opponent has had a long history of a very strong, rigid um, uh, pro-life position. And I don't think it fits the third district, even with, with the uh, Franklin County added. And so, you know, and, and David's defeated Amanda Atkins by 10 points uh, two years ago. And, you know, it's, pardon this uh, sort of partisan observation, but, you know, Republicans couldn't defeat her in that election, so they completely rejiggered and, and gerrymandered the districts here to the point of putting Douglas County <laughs> next to Colorado, for goodness sakes, you know, and completely deleted the political uh, significance of this very important county in Kansas. They just just completely just jerked away your <laughs> your your uh, you know your citizenship almost, and and it's bad for the state. And it shouldn't have been done. And I, but anyway, uh, long story short is I think uh, uh, Sharice Davids is going to be a major beneficiary of the Dobbs decision, and um, that's the way I see it right now. Yeah. Yeah. So the map had to change. Okay. There just too many people have moved into Johnson County, mm -hmm. and the way the federal rules work is it's got to be like within ten people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> literally yeah. within 10 people on how you divide that. So in 2002, this map, uh, 2002, when we you know, redrew the map, it was a, we had a Democratic incumbent, and guess what? That count, for decades, that had actually been Wyandotte, Johnson, and then run on down Miami and run down along the Missouri line. And sure enough, you know, in those couple of decades, uh, there, it suddenly was Johnson and Wyandotte County, and then they went down K-10 around Allen Fieldhouse and back again, which was a very, you know, um, I know that district pretty well, you know, from that. Um, so these, the maps have, you know, maps have always been there, um, you know, by both sides. 
and that's just the system that we have. But the real issue um, here is can Amanda Adkins, you know, give people a reason to fire Sharice Davids? Both, of, I know both of them, uh, I've known both of them before they were in politics, and they're both very capable uh, mm -hmm. leaders uh, there. I disagree severely, you know, with, with Sharice, and I think she's, uh, I think she's out of step with much of the district on when it comes to the budget and spending. I mean, there literally hasn't been a thing that, you know, that was a Biden administration goal that she didn't vote for. Um, and that district overall doesn't look that way, no matter how you would, con how you would configure it. Um, but she also has a tremendous amount of resources. I mean, she, I can't, I can't turn on my TV, um, you know, for months now without seeing a Charisse, uh, you know, add on. She, you know, and they're well done. And, you know, I think that power of incumbency has a big impact. I think whether, I think Amanda has the opportunity to break through, you know, that issue. And I also think that people are going to be sorting out things, you know, of how do I feel about, the, how do I feel about my state legislator? How do I feel about my governor? How do I feel about my state representative or my U.S. Uh, congressperson? Um, people, people really felt it viscerally after COVID that, these individuals make a big impact. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I, th I think it's gonna be interesting to see how that mm -hmm. shakes out. Last question <coughs> from me, quick, quick answer from both of you. What's your, in a nutshell, what's your advice to your party in this state for the last five or six weeks of the campaign? Um, my advice for my party is, I would think the election is not November 7th it is the first day of voting in October, mm. and that they should mobilize more and change the dynamic of those debates, uh, those issues, looking at those first people that are going in and being able to change uh, the you know, dynamic and get your perspective across. For Democrats? For Democrats, I would say stay focused intensely on the bread and butter issues, the economic issues, and for Governor Kelly, run on a record that is a solid record. And, um, and for uh, Sharice Davids, I would caution her not to overplay this abortion issue mm -hmm. and, and to stay focused on the economic issues that are important to her constituents. Um, I'm going to open it up now to questions from the audience, including the online audience. And again, if you want to submit a question online, if you're watching on YouTube, uh, you send that question to dullquestions, plural, at ku.edu, and um, somebody here will pick them up. So raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Uh, uh, Heidi and Will will bring a, a mic around, and we'll start right there. Uh, I ask that you remember that a question is, in fact, a question. It's not a speech. It has a question mark at the end of it. Um, <laughs> And, um, and speak up loudly so everybody can hear. Please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Lori. Just a second. I, I'm not sure the mic is working, Heidi. <coughs> there you go. Good afternoon. My name's Laureen Taylor. I'm a woman. I reside in Lenexa, Kansas. I'm originally from Connecticut. I'm a veteran of the U.S. military Army Nurse Corps. My husband's a combat veteran, Gulf War I. Mm. Have either of you reached out to veteran groups to determine what veterans of the U.S. military and their families are focused on pre-election 2022? And I have a second question as well. I, I think we're going to have just one. Okay, I'm sorry, but thank you. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> governor Kelly is really focused on serving veterans in the state as best a governor can. And uh, she has made veterans, you know, a priority in her administration. And, uh, you know, the veterans' issues, as you probably know, are more federally driven. So the VA hospitals and all of the VA benefits are, you know, it's, it's a federal issue more than a state issue. But Governor Kelly has, I think, been very attentive to the needs of veterans and their families in the state. Yeah, um, likewise, um, you, know, when I, you know, getting back to the you know, the federal side, you know, we haven't had a, a Democratic senator for a long time. I mean, you, you see, you know, Jerry Moran, you see uh, Senator Marshall, they spend 
an extraordinary amount of time, you know, on these mm -hmm. issues. Um, and, uh, you know, when, and you find it in, in the governor's office, um, you know, there are real challenges, you know, when the, if the federal government doesn't get it right, you know, if they can't provide services, you know, west of, of Salina, it ends up following in your lap. And so you, you really need to, you know, spend an effort, you know, with that. And, you know, we've had a lot of, you know, we've had a lot of our reservists deployed, um, you know, over the last uh, 10 years, not so much the last uh, couple of years, um, you know, but I was with them on all these deployment ceremonies and coming back and, and all of that. And, um, you know, there were a lot of these folks that really loved Kansas. And one of the things I think we're missing uh, overall is we have the big red one out here, in, you know, in Fort Riley. And every year there are about 2,500 people that retire from the big red one uh, there. How do we keep those in Kansas? Mm -hmm. That's something that I think it would be a very bipartisan way mm -hmm. of looking at because literally 85% of them go other places, even though they may would like to stay here. And I, I think that's a tremendous resource for yeah. us. Leavenworth has done an yeah. amazing job of, of really providing a welcoming home for veterans. Okay, we'll go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I think we just have to have one question. Thank you, though. Go ahead. Good afternoon to both of you. Do you think that any of the momentum from the primary is going to be focused on the vote to retain judges for the Kansas uh, yes. courts? Yes. Um, you, you, maybe, you, maybe you can explain yeah. the, the issue briefly, Jim, and then you well, have an answer clearly. <laughs> what, I think five of the seven Supreme Court uh, judges in Kansas are up for retention this year, and um, you know, I'm surprised that there hasn't been more focus on that retention vote because I think five of the seven justices of the Supreme Court were appointed by both either Kelly or Sebelius. And um, so, you know, it won't surprise me if we are surprised <laughs> on some of these retention votes, okay? So, so folks ought to keep an eye on, on that. They could wake up you know, the day after election and find some of our Supreme Court uh, judges that have not been retained. I mean, I, so just, that's a very important question and a very important issue that is not getting hardly yeah. any yeah. attention. And Jeff, you've, you've lived yeah. this issue. So. Yeah, so um, for starters, I do not, I, I'm not aware of any serious effort from the conservative side to unseat them. Uh, I have not seen fundraising, I haven't seen an organization and, and stuff like that. Um, and so I don't think if, if that happens, I think people are gonna pay more attention um, you know, to this both on the right and left. And I think they're going to, I think Kansans are really smart and I think they're going, they, I think they really see here's where they sit uh, in that and people are gonna wanna educate themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen the trial attorneys putting together some resources uh, to defend uh, a number of these, uh, but I, <coughs> I, just haven't, I haven't seen any organized part. So if it happens, I think it's going to be Kansans just sitting at home over the kitchen table saying, here's how I go. But mm -hmm. I haven't seen an organized mm -hmm. effort. Okay. I haven't either. Okay. Um, way in the back. Where are you holding? <laughs> Let me lock my chair. <clears throat> I moved here in 1979 to go to grad school, and in my, in my tenure here, the House of Representatives has only been held once by the Democrats and the Senate, never. Um, with regard to redistricting, and when we say things like, well, both sides do it, and we know that it's not really not some kind of gerrymandering rigging of things so that you actually try to pick the voters for the candidates that you believe would help them in their political futures. So wouldn't you both be more proud of Kansas if we did something like Iowa's done or that Washington State has done 
where it's not done by the political parties, but by representatives of them and also people that are citizens and maybe others that are looking to just cut things up in the most efficient, contiguous way without reaching to the western end of the state. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I think voters should be able to choose who makes that decision. I think you as an elected person, you need to be able to say that person is making that decision and, uh, and likewise on most things, okay, on that. When you go and you take that to an independent commission that is supposedly nonpartisan, it is still has a perspective. This is the most profound political act is what's the map look like? You have to have one um, you know, with that. And so my preference is do it in the sunlight. Absolutely do it in the sunlight. Um, and all of these maps, no matter who draws them, there are going to be things that are different. We had a recent experience where um, a court uh, redrew some of the maps um, in the last uh, redistricting cycle in, in 2004 um, with that. That's how we actually have the maps that we have today. Um, did the, put a bunch of incumbents together? Yeah, there were some incumbents together. There were also districts which had nobody in them. Um, you know, there, and so, you know, the familiarity may not have been there or something like that, but it was an unelected group that made that decision. Um, and I just think we need to take responsibility for stuff. And, you know, having the Senate, the governor, and the House, um, at least they're able to, you know, you're able to tell them no or yes. Bottom, bottom line, uh, I think historically, We've had good uh, drawings of the congressional districts in the state of Kansas until this year. And, and this year, we have the most egregiously um, gerrymandered congressional districts in the state in my lifetime, without question. And Douglas County is the, is the prime example of just how egregious just political gerrymandering can become. And, you know, it, the effect is that this whole county, one of the most important counties in the state, has been disenfranchised at the national level. And, and that's, that's a tragedy, and it's not good for Kansas. It's good for politics, maybe, for a short term. But Douglas County, and I could draw multiple maps that would have Douglas County in the second district or in the third district in Kansas, and if it was in the second district, you would have two very competitive congressional districts in this state. And that's what we should have. The first district is probably going to be, you know, going to be uh, Republican for as long as I'm around. <laughs> but, but, you know, this gerrymandering it, it has gone way off the, 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 uh, the, into the extremes as far as I'm concerned in Kansas. Now let me take a shot at the Democrats. We in the state have done a miserable job, and I, I want to emphasize miserable job, mm -hmm. of recruiting candidates to run for local office in this state and, and, and state representatives, for example. This year, there are 55 state representative seats in Kansas in the legislature uncontested, and about, I think, 36 or 7 of them are Republicans, Republican districts where there isn't even any contest. You know, and that's not good. And the Democratic Party needs to step up and learn how to go out and do what we did in the 1970s and 80s, and that is find candidates who can compete in these districts in the western part of the state. And we haven't done that. And it's an it's a absolute failure of the Democratic Party. Just as an, in, in, an injection from me, on the national level, that's a, been a problem for Democrats in many ways for 20 or 30 years. They've yeah. spent less time, money, and effort at the state level than Republicans mm -hmm. have. And it, right now, it shows, I yeah. think, in the national map. Let me just interject one other thing, and that is that I don't want to say that this is just a, D a Republican thing, because Democrats have done egregious, outrageous <laughs> gerrymandering in, in I, other states. I invite okay. everybody to look at yeah. the New York, the, re, yeah. the redistricted New York <laughs> state map, if you want yeah, <laughs> an example. It's, but it's, it's wrong, you know, and, yeah. and uh, anyway.
Jeff, do you have something to add? Yeah. No, no, okay. we're good. All right, all right. Further questions? So please ask your second question. Sure. I have different paper files at home. I was going through and I found <coughs> this article from the Ladies Home Journal, October 2002, about Elizabeth Dole um, prior to the campaign um, in North Carolina. She ran for uh, first woman senator and she won. She served from 2003 to 2009. And this article states espousing a traditionally Republican platform, cutting taxes, reducing regulations on business, and enforcing trade laws. I'm curious to know the current thought of the woman ca uh, candidate here in Kansas if that still rings true. Um, I, I, I think that is the, that you were a traditional Republican, I think that that's the traditional Republican um, platform, right? That, that Elizabeth Dole stood for and that she ran on when she ran for the Senate. Yeah, smaller government, lower taxes, less interference, you know, with it. And mm -hmm. uh, um, I think that's a very common Kansas theme. Um, and, you know, I don't, I, you know, we're also though, you know, we're de facto the highest tax state in the region, or you know, one of the highest tax states here in the Midwest. Uh, overall, we have more government employees per capita than like 45 other other states. Um, you know, we've we haven't done always done things you know that way, and uh, I'd like to see it be a little more responsive to us. Um, we have time for one more question. If there's one up, uh, we'll go right there. And again, please, please stand up so we can see and hear you. Thank you. Hi, there's one aspect to our election this year is the, uh, that we haven't really touched on is the attorney general race. Mm. Why is that such a crucial element to our election this year? And why do you suppose um, recent polls suggest that it's gonna be a very close race? Um, and one of our, the uh, Democratic nominee is from Douglas County, so for Mr. Slattery, why is it important for Douglas County residents to understand um, what Chris Mann brings to the table? And um, on the contrary, why is, why is it an important race to win for Mr. Kovac? Thank you. Well, I think it's very important for the state of Kansas to elect someone, uh, Attorney General, a Chief Law Enforcement Officer in the state and, uh, that's competent that is, uh, uh, hasn't been in trouble with, uh, with the, the bar and uh, is highly respected. And I think that, that what we're gonna see in the next uh, month is that that race is gonna get very, very tight. And uh, you know, the problem that, that Kobach has, the Republican nominee, is that his negatives are off the charts. And I think Kansans know him. They rejected him four years ago for governor. And uh, I think that, that when people start focusing on this, as, as Jeff has indicated, and they're just starting to do this on these secondary races, uh, I think that uh, a man is gonna surprise a lot of people and he's gonna be, uh, you know, he's gonna be elected, I, pre I predict. Yeah, I, I have, in one sense, it is a referendum on Chris Kobach yeah. because people, people know him. He's you know, probably one of the most recognizable uh, politicians uh, in the state over the last you know, decade or so. Um, so I think you know, in one hand it'll be a referendum on him. Uh, on the other hand, I think people do want to see who is this, who is this other guy? You know, most people in the room probably can't name, you know, who the other candidate is. So he has to, he has to get beyond that name ID issue, which mm -hmm. fortunately there's only two people on the ballot from his perspective. Yeah. So, um, you know, but what, you know, what's he for, you know, what kind of attorney is this? And he's got to explain him, himself there uh, with it. Other down ballot, you know, races are as well. Laura Kelly's, you know, former Lieutenant Governor got pushed over into the treasurer's job. Um, you know, will that, you know, will he be able to stay in as an incumbent, you know, there, the Republican candidate, 
uh, is a very competent guy uh, as well, was very involved in pension reforms uh, and, you know, over the state. Um, looking at the Secretary of State race, um, you have an incumbent Republican, and I can't tell you who the D is on it, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. um, you know, on that. But, that, you know, those other races, people are going to, I, I really think the, the hyper attention, people are going to have to make some decisions, you know, here. And I think the focus is going to be really concentrated, you know, over the next month. Um, it's not going to, Kansas will make their minds up in October, not in November. Yeah. Um, well, listen, the, the Dole Institute stands for bipartisan conversation and civil conversation, mm -hmm. and I think you guys have given That's us great. both yeah. today. I appreciate it. I don't think we're going to agree about gerrymandering, but otherwise, I think we're okay. So. <laughs> Uh, could I, ju I just want to say something to the audience on that is I hope you all realize that Jerry Seib is really one of the most respected journalists at the national level over the last 20 years. And I've observed him up close in Washington you know, for a long time. And he is highly respected on both sides of the political aisle. And there were, you know, a lot of politicians, Democrats and Republicans have commented I wonder what Jerry Seib is. Is he a Republican <laughs> or a Democrat? You know? I'll but take that. That, yeah. that is the highest yeah. compliment yeah. that we can pay Jerry Seib. Yeah. 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 But see, see, I I got to tell Jerry okay, Seib's story. Okay, go for it. Yeah. So, so Jerry and I went to the same high school. He was a couple years ahead of us, and he was the editor of your book. Okay, and he had national accolades. You know, for nationals you know. is stretching a little bit. Right? <laughs> no, 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 no. But no. that's okay. But, but no, for for a small for a small school in western Kansas, um, you know, there he assembled a team <coughs> of of journalists, you know, students and all that. I mean, he was a really talented guy then, and um, he has served, you know, the the nation well, that's you nice. know, at the yeah, Wall Street Journal. Nice but it you. it really it really goes back and. I, I think it's something that's in the water in Kansas. It is. Okay. Well, and I, I like all of these, or, all or, of these college or, students. Or, or maybe joins. specifically in the water in Hayes. Yes, it's possible. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Come on, guys. You know, i got to get a plug in for Atchison here, right? So. Well, you're, you're very nice, but I, I'm grateful. I, I have this feeling in doing these discussion groups that mostly what I'm doing is I'm calling up my friends and putting the elbow and the arm on them and saying, why don't you come on out? But everybody's been happy to do it, and, okay. and you guys have been generous with your time, and I appreciate that very much. And you've all been generous uh, in uh, your willingness to come out and engage in the kind of conversations that we have here. So thank you, and thank you guys very much.